Hi, uh, I'm James Cook. Um, I'm a lecturer in early music at the University of Edinburgh. Um, I specialise predominantly in medieval and renaissance music, but I also do quite a lot of work on TV, film and video game and music within that. And I'm Kenny, and I currently work at Aberdeen University in Dundee, where I specialise in music technology, and particularly sound and music for video game and VR. Um, now, as audiophiles, I think both James and I recognise that acoustics play a very important role in how we make sense of the world around us, and they contribute enormously to our sense of being present within a space. And yet, it's one of those points of interface that's very often neglected. Um, I spoke to Laura Dilloway recently, who worked on Guerrilla Games' action VR combat game, Rigs, and she told me that they spent so much time and effort in developing a control system that didn't actually induce vomiting in the players that the sound of music was little more than an add-on at the end. So what we wanted to do was develop a VR experience that foregrounded music and performance and that used VR as a way to explore space as a dimension of music performance. James. Okay. Uh, so what we aimed to do essentially was to recreate two historical performances within two very different historical performance venues. That's St Cecilia's Hall, the oldest purpose-built concert hall in Scotland, and the Nifco Palace, and specifically the chapel of this, which is the Great Pleasure Palace of the Kings and Queens of Scotland. Um, what we did to do this was scan both venues with LiDAR, reduce these into low-poly models, which can then be built in a game engine, uh, rebuild then the current space so they can get a sense of how the space was, is now rather than in the past. We've then worked uh, in detail with Historic Environment Scotland, with the University of Edinburgh, archaeologists and a lot of archival research to try and work out what the space would have been like in the past. We've then been able to use ray tracing software on our recreation to essentially <coughs> recreate the original acoustic as it would have been. Having then re uh, researched and chosen specific music which is linked to these sites, uh, edited and recorded these within anechoic chambers, uh, we've then been able to produce a version of the music which has no natural acoustic which we can just drop into the spaces. Um, and we've then been able to uh, use our physical, uh, the physical spaces as they are now against our digital recreation of the present day to test how effective that is so we can be relatively sure that we're pretty close to how it sounded in the past. One of the key things that we learned was that musicians hate performing in anechoic chambers. Um, no great surprise, but it does appear to be a skill that can be learned and developing expertise in that area was a kind of unexpected but welcome outcome of the project. Similarly, the production process for VR audio disrupts established music production workflows. The sort of critical listening that takes place in production and post-production um, simply don't translate across to VR audio production. And I think there's a real opportunity to develop new production tools and workflows focused on music for VR. When we took our VR models out to the public, they were very warmly and affectionately received. I think, as many people have said today, the appetite from the public is enormous, and curators are equally keen to use VR to offer new modes of engagement that allow the public to play, not just with heritage objects, but those intangible and experiential aspects of our shared heritage. And I think through all of this, we've identified the capabilities and limitations of the current state of the art and where and how we can contribute uh, significant advancements. We've been quite keen throughout this to try and keep a dialogue between the various different sectors we've been working with. So our outputs have involved a lot of conference presentations and workshops, uh, both in things such as the Medieval Renaissance Music Conference, so looking at specialists in historical musicology, uh, taking it to the Ludo Musicology Conference, so seeing video game audio specialists, um, trying it out with MA students in museum creatorship, uh, 10 days workshopping it um, in the Manchester Science Festival to see what the public thought, uh, and similarly our forthcoming paper pro uh, products also should be in similarly linked spaces. And in the last 15 seconds then, <laughs> uh, we plan to create dedicated public VR access points at three sites. The two venues that we modelled, St Cecilia's Hall and Linlithgow Palace, but also the Engine Shed, Historic Environment Scotland Centre for Digital Innovation. Building on our experience of VR music performance and production, the award-winning classical label Hyperion is working with us to create what we think might be the world's first classical album to be recorded, produced and post-produced entirely in VR. 
And in addition to that regular CD recorded anechoically, we're going to develop a companion app that allows users to download additional content and remix it so that they can experience it at different locations and at different points of time. And what we hope is that that will open up new audiences and new revenue streams, both for the label and for the consort. And I think I'll end there, 36 seconds over. Mm -hmm. Come Thank and you. see it in the thing downstairs. <laughs> <laughs>